I'm Jenny Harris of American Hydroponics and welcome to our monthly webinar. Today we have a special treat as we listen to our Vice President Joe Schwartz share with Charlie McKenzie on Crop Talks podcast about his 35 years as a commercial hydroponic grower and also all of the exciting things that are happening in our industry. So listen in and as always don't forget Type in any questions you have. We will address those questions. So listen in and don't forget to type in your questions. You know, it doesn't matter if it, we were talking about farmers 200 years ago or farmers today. The bottom line is high quality crops, good yields, consistent production, management of our costs. It's farming. You're listening to Crop Talk, the podcast for agricultural leaders. The guests you hear on the show are experimenting with new ideas and tactics. They're in the lab, greenhouse, or field, getting their hands dirty and making agriculture prosper. You'll hear about their innovations, successes, and their challenges. But more importantly, how they overcame them. My name is Charlie McKenzie, and I'm your host. Let's talk crops. What's up, folks? This is Charlie McKenzie. I am here with Joe Swartz, the VP of American Hydroponics. I'm so excited to have him on the show. We've uh, become friends over the past few months and uh, exchanged a lot of uh, different, very interesting horticultural uh, conversations and, and production related conversations. And, you know, um, in talking, we thought it'd be great to have him on the show and and talk more about what he's learned in his career, as as well as um, you know what's changed since he started, and also a little bit about his past and, and his family's production past. Uh, I think the insights will be many. So, without further ado, Joe, how you doing today? Good, Charlie. Thanks very much for having me on. Absolutely. Well, like I said before, we're uh, we're stoked to have you on, and, and I think there's going to be uh, insights of many. So, for you know my own edification and, and also our listeners, could you um, please give us a, a little bit more about yourself and, and your history, uh, and you know how you got into the industry and, and what your you know current role is. Oh, okay, cool. Well, um, I am uh, probably first and foremost, I'm a hydroponic vegetable and herb grower. Just this January celebrated uh, my 35th year as a full-time wow. year-round grower and uh, I, I'm a fourth generation farmer in western Massachusetts and so kind of a an interesting path kind of led me into hydroponics and uh, it's been a, a very very interesting experience uh, since then for about the past 17 or 18 years I've also served as a consultant to the hydroponics industry kind of as a farmer focusing on commercial production. So I, I've, I've been very, very fortunate to have traveled all around the world and worked with commercial farms and commercial growers to either incorporate or improve controlled environment ag practices in their own growing operations. And for the past four years, I've also been, as you mentioned, the vice president of American Hydroponics, also known as AM Hydro. It's headquartered in Arcata, California. Similarly, has been in business for about 35 years as well. I, uh, I've been Working with, I've worked with some growers from uh, that are M Hydro growers over the years. I've done a little bit of work with M Hydro, and circumstances just kind of pulled us together uh, a number of years back. So I have have joined M Hydro as uh, one of the leading hydroponic systems equipment manufacturers in North America. And uh, as uh, as I've joined, we've now expanded into professional grower training. We train growers all over the world for commercial production. We do a lot of consulting. We help growers, even growers that don't use M Hydro systems. We we help with uh, system troubleshooting, growing techniques. We do a lot with uh, biopass control, which obviously brought us together. And now we we also do project management. So we help basically a new operations kind of start from the beginning, and we work through everything from kind of preliminary business planning up to some construction management, uh, grower training, kind of helping them get started and, and up and running. We really focus on not selling equipment or supplies per se, but actually making growers successful in what they're doing. Yeah, full solutions. I, I can tell you, Joe, a little uh, kind of little story. When, when I first started really exploring the 
you know, uh, commercial hydroponics market, leafy greens production. You know, I, I was an ornamental grower before that, a little bit of hydroponic uh, cannabis experience, but not not the same. And, and when I started exploring, I remember I kept seeing the same design of hydroponic systems. And, and after a while, I mean, being honest, I kind of thought that that was just the design. Then I came to to recognize that it was one of many, but the reason I kept seeing it so much was because it was Am Hydro product. So it was uh, it was kind of interesting to me, full circle, kind of understanding that yeah, all those pictures were out there because of how many customers you guys have served. So I found it interesting when we connected, uh, you know, kind of having that history before ever meeting you, um, and uh, you know, I, I kind of want to go backwards a little bit to something that you said a little bit earlier in that response is you kind of had a, an interesting entrance into hydroponics or, or a kind of interesting path that led you specifically to hydroponics. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, as I mentioned, I'm a fourth generation farmer. Uh, as I was young growing up, my dad and uncle had uh, been running a fairly large scale potato uh, farm in, in Western Mass. Um, their parents before them were dairy farmers and their parents before them were mixed vegetable farmers. So, so really farming has always been in my blood, if you will. As I was growing up though, I saw some of the challenges with farming. Basically we owned a small 40 acre farm in Western Mass. And uh, my father and uncle, as they grew the size of their potato operation, they rented a lot of land in the area. Uh, we live in a college town area with a lot of agricultural land. And so they had up to 400 acres at one time of potatoes. Wow. And um, as I was kind of growing up, my, my uncle passed away prematurely because of pesticide exposure, uh, mm -hmm. illnesses related to pesticide exposure. And my dad's body was just beaten up. Um, he had knees replaced, hip problems, back problems, a lot of health issues related to the, more of the physical injuries. Right. Uh, you know, farming is a tough business. And so as I was growing up, I was very interested in farming, but I really, I was not a big fan of, you know, the seasonality where you're really busting for, uh, you know, several months out of the mm -hmm. year. And then up to the year, things were slow. I saw, you know, physically what it had done to my father and my uncle. And then, of course, in the early 1980s, there was a, a real estate boom in our area because of the college towns and land became very, very expensive. And so most of the land that they had rented became too expensive. Uh, it would have been sold off for development by the landowners. And so we, we suddenly lost our ability to grow large uh, acreages of crops. So I, I, I was kind of pushed into a corner where I didn't want to be farming, where I was going to be, you know, my body was going to be wrecked by the time I was 40. And I had to find something that I could do that was very, very intensive that I could do on a small scale. And the idea of either extended season or year-round farming was really, really appealing to me. So I was fortunate enough to meet Dr. Peter Shippers, who was hmm. a research associate at Cornell University in the 1960s. And he had done a lot of the really pioneering work in hydroponics uh, on the East Coast anyway, regarding uh, NFT or nutrient film technology production. Right. So he was, he was experimenting with different plant spacings and how to increase your efficiencies. And I thought that was really, really very, very interesting. So he sold me some equipment and kind of took me under his wing for a little while. Um, he had since passed away, but he, um, he kind of got me my start. And so I built a, a hydroponic, a 4,000 square foot hydroponic facility here on my farm. And, uh, Basically just started there and have been rolling ever since, uh, expanded it somewhat, but, uh, you know, really focused on working with other growers as well. And uh, since I started, really tried to dial in both the horticultural production to grow really high quality crops, to maximize you know, the overall production, and to really focus on completely pesticide-free production, which, as you know, is uh, very challenging and, and kind of a, a science all of it its, on its own. But uh, but that's kind of where I uh, where I came from and, and kind of what brought me to where I am right now. Wow, that, I, I think that's special. I do. I didn't know that story, and I'm I'm so glad that uh, I was uh, able to listen to it. I mean that obviously it's near and dear to your heart and now you're doing something about it and you've been doing something about it. I think that that's, um, that's special. Like I said before, I, I, so it's also interesting to me kind of 
inferring maybe that, you know, with a lot of hydroponic production now, a, a lot of it's more localized and, and you start to know your farmer a little bit more. And it seems like, you know, if you're talking about fourth generation, then, you know, back in that fourth generation, then those people definitely knew, you know, your family as farmers. And I think that's an interesting correlation. You know, there's a gap in there in some of those generations where it's, it's mostly commercial, but it seems like we're trying to get back to knowing our farmer and, and you're helping us do that. Uh, so I, I find that interesting as well. It's a real cool model and, and you're, you're a hundred percent correct. Um, when, you know, previous generations had farmed here, they had sold all of the products right here within the community. And, and, and early on, of course, a lot of it was, was through trading. And they were trading uh, farm products um, with that they didn't sell necessarily. And then as my father and uncle were farming, they were selling large volumes of potatoes, and most of them were actually shipped down south. So the distribution model was, you know, quite a sub substantial difference. Yeah. Then we've kind of come full circle, and, you know, we, we now – we had almost 20,000 square feet at one point in hydroponic production, and we were selling all within about a 10-mile area. So so we've kind of gone from the small localized distribution to large-scale, big distance, and then back again. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, but the cool thing is that I think we can keep the quality, the freshness, and the cleanliness at the same level, but with advancing technology and, and techniques that you guys are improving on and, and people you're working with in the industry, you can almost bring that, those qualities of food to the masses. And to me, those, those are the qualities that makes local food really important other than the connection physically with the farmer. So it's exciting that maybe we can bring local food on a scale. Yeah, that, I couldn't agree more. We, we're seeing a lot of that, um, and uh, it's real exciting. So it's good for the farms. It's good for the consumer. So it's really uh, it's nice to see that trend kind of going that way. Absolutely. So Joe, you're, you're we um, are in year 2019. What was the most significant industry change in the last five years with regards to hydroponic production? Well, I would say in the past couple of years, obviously a lot has happened, um, both good and bad. And I think they're both important to kind of understand in terms of really great things that we've seen in just the past couple of years. One is a much greater consumer acceptance and understanding of hydroponics. The, um, the consumer, uh, the buying public has become much more sophisticated and understands a lot more about food from the standpoint of where it comes from to how it's grown to what it may be environmental impacts or mm -hmm. other, other different uh you know, pieces come into play. So they're not just kind of mindlessly buying leafy greens, but they're really understanding a lot more about that. And they're, you know, kind of voting with their dollars, if you will, by supporting specific farms, whether it's, you know, a local farm they know, or a farm that utilizes good growing practices or, or real comprehensive food safety protocols that they agree with. So people understand much, much better about what hydroponically grown is. I mean, you know, many years ago, I would have people, you know, they had no idea. I would explain to them what I do. They would have no idea what I was talking about. And, you know, we've heard people talking about hydroplanics and hydrophonics and, and all of these things. And, <laughs> and now, now people really understand a lot more. So that's really great. So it helps, it helps on so many different levels, but having people be much more savvy uh, about their food is, is really great. One of the great things I really think, and, and this is mostly driven by the technologies that we see mm -hmm. in Controlled and I know, is so many more young people coming in yep. to farming, which I love. When I was in, you know, in ag school at the Stockbridge School of Agriculture, you know, I was in, you know, sustainable farming class that had about 15 or 16 students in it. And I went back about two years ago to lecture to the same class, and I was lecturing to 300 students, wow. most of whom did not have family farms to go back to. These are people who don't necessarily have a farm per se, but they're going into farming. And I think that's just amazing. And that's really, really, really great. And I think that, that we've, we're going to see more of that. From the kind of physical side of the production, mm -hmm. in the past couple of years, we've seen great technological advancements, both particularly in you know the environmental controls, environmental management of our growing. We're understanding higher production 
techniques a lot better and we're able to manipulate things like our physical environment, our lighting and our nutrition to get better quality and more food safe products. I think that's really, really tremendously, you know, important data collection, of course, you know, yep. our growers just have tools that enable them to make better decisions. And so that's really, really great. So all those are very, very positive things. Um, there's a few things that are, I think, a challenge in the industry that have happened. Okay. And again, again related mostly to technology, mm. is that anyone who has done any research into controlled environment ag, if you were a newbie, obviously, Charlie, you, yep. you, you've been in this industry, you know a lot about what's going on. But if you were new to the industry and you just started doing some basic internet research, you are flooded with an incredible amount of information. And yeah. So much of it is contradictory. Unfortunately, a lot of it is not good information. There's a lot of false information out there, a lot of misleading information. People are all kind of trying to get your attention or your buying dollars and, and positioning themselves as having the system or right. the techniques. Or We see so many, and I'm using air quotes here, hydroponics experts that have never run hydroponic farms or don't really have significant experience in controlled environment agriculture and they're selling their services or their systems at, you know with a certain authority yeah. and unfortunately we've seen it as a grower and a consultant this is one of the big challenges that I'm facing is that I have people all the time calling me you know they were sold on a you know a certain system that was not appropriate or they received growing advice from a expert that doesn't understand commercial growing or doesn't really understand horticultural practices or biopest control. And the results can be disastrous. And I have seen so many good people literally lose everything they have because they just, they just, you know, kind of made the, the wrong decisions or was, were given the wrong guidance. And so right now in the industry, it's very, very difficult to kind of weed through what's effective and what's not effective. And I'm sure, you know, Charlie, you and I have been connected on social media and we've, we've both been posting, you know, things, yep. information, but both you and then what, what I always try to do is kind of show people what's, you know, what's working and why and explaining that and kind of being very open. Yep. That information. We always like to say results are what count. And, you know, if someone can tell you something, if they can't show you, yeah. then what they're telling you is not very valid. And unfortunately, we, we have people struggling to, to really find out what information is good and what's not. So, so that's kind of one of the, the big changes in the past five years that I've seen that, that I, I'm hoping we can kind of reverse that trend. But it, it's real important. And as you know, being a horticulturalist, the technological tools are going to advance and they're going to make things easier or better for farms, but they're just tools. And when people look at something like a, a specific type of system or a growing method as kind of the be all end all, it creates problems. And so we, you know, we, we really try to look at every situation and apply our technologies properly. So I think over the next few years, as the technological advances keep coming, that's going to continually become a problem. And that's why I hope people like yourself who are professionals in the industry can kind of help guide, you know, especially the newer people with that same good, solid information. Because there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of great growers. It's just a matter of kind of connecting the, the two with the, um, with the new people coming into the industry. Yeah. I, I mean, isn't it amazing that we're all so much more connected, but there's that much more information out there. So I think something you said that I always tell people about, you know, new advances in uh, this software or, or this sensor or, or whatever it may be is good tools make a good grower great. It doesn't make a bad grower good ever. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Along the same lines, you, you know, my wife gives me a recipe and says, go cook this. And it doesn't come out the same way that it does when she does it because she's done it a few times. So it's along those same lines. And, and I, I'm definitely with you on the fact that we all have the opportunity, those that are that are in the industry that know quality people and know what quality results are to promote those people consistently refer, ref, give them referrals. But I guess also, you know, 
put the word out there that, Hey, this isn't necessarily, um, it's not as rosy of an industry as you may think, especially when it comes to those that are, are trying to sell something without any, um, real value. So I wonder how, how we can get more feedback on, on those types of things without, you know, people losing their house or their livelihood. Cause that's, I mean, that's tragic, Joe. I, I think you bring that up. I mean, I've thought and thought about it myself, investing quite a bit of money into something like that, as well as helped other people do that. And the thought of someone going out and having that same passion and gumption to go try something new, getting uh, taken by someone with, you know, nefarious intentions is it's sickening. So um, it's really yeah. unfortunate. And we see it, we see it all the time. We, we do a lot, you know, to try to reverse that. I know that, you know, a, a lot of the uh, fantastic social media posts that you've been putting out there are specifically gained, uh, geared toward giving people that, you know, practical, usable information. And, uh, and I think that's really important. We just finished up last week in Humboldt County, uh, our two-day grower seminar. We have mm-hmm. several times a year, hands-on in a commercial greenhouse hydroponic growing seminars and you know we, we like to get people in and and kind of get them knee deep into the yeah. business and they're showing the plants yeah <laughs> absolutely and we 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 always like to you know we're always working with the leading technological providers we're you know always advancing our own technologies but this is farming and all the technologies are tools and we want to be able to give you new and improved tools and tools that will make you faster and better but at the at the end of the day, you're farming, and this is horticultural production. And um, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it, we were talking about farmers 200 years ago or farmers today. The bottom line is high quality crops, good yields, consistent production, management of our costs. It's farming, and so yeah. uh, the more people like you get out there and give people that information, the technologies are, again are just tools that we're using, but the the growing techniques are rock solid and they provide the results. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. So when we get into kind of hitting on what you talked about with the seminars, okay. So you're, you're bringing people out, you're showing them physically what they're going to be looking at, how they're going to be doing it. You know, the, the type of equipment they'll be using. I mean, literally doing what they're going to be doing if they invest in the system. And I think that that's, that's massive, but there's also a key thing that I think your team understands well, and we've talked about this before. And what it is, is that one size does not fit all. And really, there is no one size fit all at all in any ag. But I think specifically, you guys have really focused in on looking at each customer and potential client as their own specific situation and how you can give them the most value. So, I'd love to dig a little bit deeper into that and understand how you and your team assess those things and try to offer that specific tailored approach to each customer. Oh yeah. That's a great question. And I, and I I definitely agree with you a hundred percent with deference to my friend, Glenn Bierman from Growtainers who loves to say one size does not fit all. It, It certainly is very, very true. All of our systems, all of our, growing operations are all very, very different and very unique. And they, and they should be, and they should be approached that way. I often ask people, I say, what, you know, as a farmer, what is your most valuable tool? Is it a tractor? Is it a rake or a hoe? Is it a, uh, a hay baler or is it a computer? Mm-hmm. And, the, and the simple answer is it's, it's, well, what are you, what job are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? And so we have to look at that, you know, and, and our whole team, we, Basically, at Amhydro, we have, you know, over 100 years of commercial growing experience on staff at any one time. We're basically a company of commercial growers. And so when you call any of us, you know, you get someone who actually understands what it's like to have a heater go down at 2 o'clock in the morning in the middle of the winter or to suddenly come in and find aphids in your lettuce. You know, we understand that. And so... When, when someone comes to us or a project comes to us, we have to look very carefully at a number of factors. You know, the, the physical geography, where exactly they're located is, is you know, just kind of the, the launch pad. But so what, you know, what are you looking to grow based on what are, you, what are your markets looking for? And what type of, um, you know, marketing model are you, are you 
selling a, a retail package product? Are you selling a bulk product to a, a repacker or to a food service industry? What's your level of technology? What is your end goal for the business? What is your training? What is the physical infrastructure that you've got available? How are you planning on accessing markets from a, a shipping and logistical standpoint? what your overall budget is. These are all really, really important pieces that then go into, you know, we, we plug them into our model of, okay, this is how then we build out your farm because we provide certain tools and, and guidance to use them appropriately. Kind of a, as a very, very quick broad brush look, when someone is looking to say they're going to be producing lettuce for mm -hmm. the market, the size of an operation you know, it's dependent upon one of two factors, really, is either what your budget is to start the operation. So for X number of dollars, we can build a, a design and build a system that will produce X, and it'll produce a certain amount. Or they come to us and they say, well, we need a certain number. We need 10,000 heads of lettuce a week. So we then can design the size based upon that criteria. So those two criteria are kind of what will determine the size or the scope of a, of a facility, but all those other factors that I had just mentioned all kind of go into what the growing environment and environmental controls would look like, what type of actual growing system. Um, you know, we, we are not a, a company that just sells this growing system or that growing system, and that's kind of your one size fits all. And, that, and we see a lot of that, especially in the indoor vertical system market or the shipping container yeah. system where it's it's this system, and you can put it anywhere and use it for any application. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. There's, there's a lot of tools out there. If you have a plumber come to your house with a truck full of tools, and you you know you know you have to wonder what that plumber is going to bring into your house for tools. You know, it completely depends upon what they're trying to do. Is it, are they repla repairing a sink? Are they installing a new shower? You know, all of those things. So that they would, as the experienced expert determine what tools to bring in based on what the job is. Yep. And we do the same exact thing. We we bring our experience and our understanding of not only the production models, but also of the, the marketing and distribution models. We work with growers That's in 66 countries all over the world. And so we, we know a lot about different, particularly here in North America, particular markets and distribution and shipping lines. And so we can kind of help that grower then assemble the the plan for how we would proceed with designing a, a growing system and then kind of go from there. So it's very, very important to early on to do a lot of this analysis and then to base all of the, the big decisions in terms of the infrastructure on that. Well, I'm, I hope that the listeners understand if they haven't heard it before, they heard it first here that uh, the process of getting a leafy green operation off the ground is not as simple as growing plants. And I think the thing that I want to highlight the most in what you just said, all of it extremely important, but the thing I want to highlight the most is something that I firsthand had the experience of getting advice on. I never put it into to practice, but I, I come looking for, you know, advice on, hey, I want to start, you know, a 3,000 square foot leafy green operation or, or something um, along those lines. And and some of the first pieces of advice that I got, and I and it definitely came from your team, was why do you want to sell it and to who and where, you know, and and that was first, where whereas you know, a lot of manufacturers for equipment, a lot of consultants, the, the first thing that turns on in their brain is they need my service. They want to grow. Let's go. And if you can't sell it, it doesn't mean it, it's just going to rot. So th the market and, and developing that and understanding, and like you said, being in 66 different countries and even more unique markets, being able to see, hear, get all that feedback on what exactly is working, what isn't, that's invaluable. Yeah, it's so it really is. It's it's so important. And we we literally more often than not, when someone comes to us with a planned project in mind, a newer grower that is, mm -hmm. um, we almost always convince them to scale back. Yeah. Sure. Sure, it sounds like a great idea to say, no, 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 we'd like to grow, we would like to sell you a much larger system and, yeah. you know, go ahead. We, we really understand that 
we understand what our, our growing systems are capable of. So we know what they can produce. But the big question mark is, can you, as you just said, can you sell? Can you market these products effectively? And if you can't, then yeah, then everything else falls apart. And so so understanding your market, starting, I always suggest that growers start a little smaller than they had originally planned. One, the learning curve in the industry is pretty steep. Yep. So um, it's important to kind of learn Having you know professional guidance and 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 whatnot is is also valuable, but but really as a grower you you're, you're going to learn a lot no matter what as you do it, and so making those mistakes and blowing through that learning curve on a more manageable scale is more important, and then cultivating and developing your market. It's a great theory to say, well, if I have 10,000 heads of lettuce a week, obviously we eat 21 million pounds of lettuce every day in this country. So obviously I'll be able to sell it. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. So so being able to get into the market, establish yourself in the, the fresh produce and the perishables industry, the markets can be very volatile and yeah. they, they won't just instantly embrace you as a grower and just buy everything you've got there's a certain feeling out period there's a certain cautious approach that they will take so it does take time and uh by doing that at a on a more reasonable and uh, uh careful basis definitely you know it benefits everyone so so yeah the marketing the sales of the product is always very very important and when people kind of i see people speaking at events all the time and they and they you know kind of wave the, the, the warning flag and say, we're going to, you know, we're running out of food. We're running out of space. We desperately need more food. Well, yes and no, the fresh produce industry is very competitive and you can't just walk into any market with a large volume of product and expect to sell it. So it, it takes time. So approaching that in a much more careful, measured approach is definitely to the grower's benefit. Great points. I couldn't agree more. With your experience in the industry and, and knowing, I mean, knowing what your family has done in past generations, plus having a pretty good pulse, if uh, in terms of uh, relative terms of people who are working in the industry, having a really good pulse on the industry now, you know, using your outlook and vision where do you think the future of the hydroponic industry is headed and and why well i think we've got a lot of very exciting things on the on the horizon kind of as we talked about earlier where we we've kind of had our food production and distribution system has kind of evolved over to this long distance factory farm kind of approach we're now seeing pushed back uh we're pushing back to kind of a lo more localized production so controlled environment agriculture as the the need for higher quality product for a higher level of food safety becomes more important as growers uh, excuse me as consumers start understanding more and demanding more of these controlled environment ag products and we're already seeing this but i think that's going to really accelerate so we're we're in a process our, our company as well as others are in the process of developing, you know, larger scale hydroponic farms strategically located around North America, very, you know, much more close to mm. population centers, closer to where it's consumed, also strategically located better on sh different shipping lines. Um, these are all things that, you know, in the past it was difficult because you, you know, are where our, our climate is the best for growing and where the soils are best for growing is not necessarily close to where the populations are. And that's kind of what had led our industrial agricultural system to where it is. So now with hydroponic technology, we're again in, you know, able to put that food production where it's needed. Um, I've designed and built rooftop farms in New York City, rural hydroponic farms in rural Kansas. Yeah. Um, and everywhere in between. And so you can take that high quality food production and put it anywhere. So we're now seeing that shift to, you know, regional food production facilities. You know, we've got several large scale operations in the Northeast and then the South, Southeast and mid Atlantic area. And, and so as we're seeing the industry over the next five, 10, 15 years develop, I, I think that that's going to be a big part of that, 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 newer and improved distribution production and distribution model on the technology side as our lighting and our environmental control technologies 
uh, evolve and our data collection. Growers are just going to become faster. They're going to be able to make better decisions. They're going to grow higher quality crops. Um, level of food safety and traceability is going to, you know, continue to increase uh, dramatically. And, and, and uh, food contamination issues in leafy greens hopefully will kind of become a thing of the past or at least right. dramatically reduced. And I also see a larger number of uh, crop selections that are grown. You know, we, we kind of think right now in hydroponics, tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers in North America are obviously the largest produced, mm-hmm. you know, per acreage basis. With a lot of leafy greens catching up quickly. But I, I see a lot more in terms of culinary herbs, pharmaceutical and nutraceutical crops. We're seeing plant-based research for, you know, every, like I said, everything from the medicinal type crops to flavorings, to the cosmetics industry, to fragrances. There's so much plant-based research going on. Controlled environment agriculture just fits into that really well. And I also think that's going to be a very big, um, uh, over the next, you know, maybe decade or so, uh, we're going to see a lot of that. So so we're, we're, we're not going to get away from Traditional farming, I hear people a lot say, you know, traditional farming has killed the planet. Traditional farming is dead. It's no good. That's not true. And, and, and I, I'm lucky enough to travel all over and work with some of the greatest farmers, uh, you know, all the way across the United States and Canada. And, um, and, and we're still going to be producing most of our food that way. But controlled environment agriculture is offering us some very, very tremendous opportunities for High quality leafy greens production, high quality fruit and vegetable production, plant research. Um, there's just so many doors opening up for that. So I see a lot of great potential, you know, coming coming soon. And the technology is a big part of that. But I think it's the applications of the technology and how growers use them. Right. Um, again, making the toolbox analogy, how growers use them is really what's going to drive the industry forward. Oh man, I love the I love the uh, outlook and and I I think you're spot on. Controlled environment agriculture is going to have one of the biggest impacts. Now I think it's it's interesting how a lot of individuals, maybe some of the ones you alluded to in the past, think okay, vertical farms are the only thing that's going to save us. And to me, it's the fact more so that it's a controlled environment and it doesn't have to be a vertical farm, but controlled environment means that you can collect data and then act upon that data and influence control of variables. And by doing that, you become inherently more efficient. Now, I think in traditional farming, we're collecting more data than we ever have before and we're becoming more efficient there. So, so you're right. There's a place for both of them, but the, the driving force I I do think is going to be controlled environment agriculture and it's a really bright future. It's exciting to be a part of that. And and I'm sure for you, what a career so far and seeing where it's come from to where it is now and, and kind of that vision you have for, for the future. That's definitely uh, worth a book, if you will, Joe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, yeah, and I agree. And it's going to be a wild ride. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the next 10 and 20 and 30 years to see how things progress and where they go. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I've you know, been able to work with so many tremendous people like yourself and others. And, and I think that that type of uh, opportunity is just going to continually grow for the industry. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, Hey, I, I appreciate the kind words, Joe. If, if a listener, those that are out there finding value in this or, or those want to learn more, wanted to get a hold of you or wanted to talk to someone at Am Hydro about the products, how would they go about doing that? Okay. So uh, obviously the website, amhydro.com, that's A-M-H-Y-D-R-O.com. For, there's a, a ton of information. Like you, we try to get as much usable information out there. And, um, you know, not just inspirational. We like to, you know, share uh, photographs. We, we have a pretty heavy social media presence. We like to share photographs of, of all of our growing operations. We don't do Photoshop pictures or computer-generated renderings or anything. We show only real pictures of real farms that are, are successful. And, a lot of people like to look at those just for inspiration, but there's a lot of usable information and we try to get that out. So 
Pam Hydro's website is, is valuable. Uh, I'm very easy to reach. My email is just joe at amhydro.com. We have presence on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I also myself have, have my own LinkedIn and uh, Twitter pages. On Twitter, I'm at Hydro Consultant. Dot, uh, not dot com, I'm sorry, at Hydro Consultant. And then LinkedIn is just Joe Swartz. And again, you'll you'll just kind of see, you know, daily updates, you know, new pictures and updates. And we're very, very open to sharing information and helping people. Again, you don't have to have an EM Hydro system, but uh, we want to see the entire industry move forward. So if you have questions, if you have problems, just want to talk about something related to controlled environment ag, we encourage people to reach out and uh, we'd love to have that dialogue. Well, I, folks, if you're listening, he definitely ain't lying because that's how we met. I reached out to him, saw a lot of his content, reached out to him, you know, number of months ago, and and we connected right away um, on a variety of different topics and and nurtured that relationship. And so, I think if anyone's listening and and they, like Joe said, want to learn and have some inspiration or connect with the team go to social media, check them out, follow them, connect with them and uh, help contribute to uh, all of us having a, a better future going forward. That's great. I really appreciate the opportunity, Charlie. It's uh, great to speak with you and hopefully um, people got some good uh, usable information. from it. Absolutely. Hey, I appreciate it, Joe. Uh, until next time, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. That was Charlie McKenzie and Joe Schwartz, Charlie McKenzie of Crop Talks Podcast sign up listen in for their regular podcast but we also have a ton of things going on this time of year everything is happening so uh, we have a couple of specials going on for you we have our next two-day hands-on seminar in june that's coming up and we have a special deal for you uh it is 695 dollars for the two-day seminar which includes breakfast and lunch as well if you do this online and put in the code sim Combo, S-E-M-C-O-M-B-O, which will show up on your screen, you'll get not only the special discounted price for the seminar, but two nights of the hotel paid for as well. So you'll be sure and want to do that. Also, don't forget to join us for our next webinar. Be sure and sign up for it. It's on May 16th, and as always, it's at 1 o'clock Pacific time, and that will be on the cost and profit profitability of running a hydroponic operation. So there are all sorts of them out there. We get these kind of comments literally every single day. We call we have people calling us up who want to start um, a hydroponic operation, big or small, uh, and they're wanting to know what are the costs, what are, are some of the, the pitfalls to look for. So be sure and join us. Join us on March 16th at 1 o'clock Pacific time. Sign up for the webinar and you can watch it anytime. Thanks very much and I hope you enjoyed the, the webinar this month.